I want to begin my weak signal contribution to our discussion today by describing a very simple experiment that was conducted by one of my former students who's now at the University of Chicago. Um, what he did was ask uh, morning commuters in Chicago, people taking trains, buses, taking taxi cabs around town, uh, if they'd be willing to be in an experiment. And if they agreed, they were randomly assigned to one of three conditions. Some people were told, just do whatever you normally do during your commute. Other people were told that make sure sometime during your commute to engage in social interaction with someone. Talk to a commuter next to you, uh, talk to your ca taxi cab driver. And people in the third condition were told to make sure they didn't do that. Don't talk to anyone on uh, your commute. And the results are, I think, quite uh, striking. The people who were assigned to talk to someone dreaded that thing, oh, I've got work to do, or oh, I, who, who knows who I'm going to end up talking to. Uh, in fact, they're a lot happier. Um, and this speaks to our fundamental um, social uh, nature. As uh, Aristotle noted almost 2,500 years ago, we're social species through and through. Um, and so when uh, one of the commentators in the background reading you were all asked to take in said that people don't really like to interact with others. They'd rather just take their smartphone and put it over a scanner. That's just not right. It's true that we don't like to wait in lines, but we do like to interact with people. In fact, we need to interact with people. Um, I'm going to show you some data that reinforces this point uh, even more. Oop, accidentally already showed it. This is the health effects, that is, the likelihood of dying or not, as a result of a variety of lifestyle changes that we all know we might want to make. So if you live in an environment where there's uh, going from an environment with lots of air pollution to very little, increases your longevity. Um, increasing physical activity increases your longevity. Going from a heavy smoker to a life, uh, light smoker increases your longevity. All of those things register as you would expect. None of them have as big of an effect of being socially isolated versus being connected to other people. There's not a country in the world right now that's trying to get its citizens to be more connected to one another, and yet they'd all be uh, better off if they did. Um, <clears throat> so as we try to anticipate what the world's going to be like in this future uh, super productive age, unless we take into account people's fundamental uh, sociality, we're going to make some mistakes in our forecast. And that relates directly to the second point that I want to make, which I'm going to introduce with a um, famous scene from uh, what the American Film Institute dubs the third greatest film of all time. Uh, now I've just distracted you from the rest of my talk as you're going to be trying to think what are the first two uh, <laughs> greatest films. Inside of us, we both know you belong with Victor. You're part of his work, the thing that keeps him going. If that plane leaves the ground and you're not with him, you'll regret it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. But what about us? We'll always have Paris. <laughs> so, we'll always have Paris. There's a lot of wisdom in that line, particularly in a world That's of material place, abundance. Um, that is to say, uh, for people with limited... Uh, income, which is most people, you often have to make certain kinds of choices. A uh, choice between um, new dining room furniture or going to Madrid or putting a new roof on the house or tickets to, uh, season tickets to a theater. And people, when reasoning through those dilemmas, often say to themselves, yeah, I'd really like the experience, but you know, I'll have it and it'll come and go in a flash. The dining room furniture will always be there. And although that's true in a material sense, it's just not at all true psychologically. That is, you adapt to the dining room furniture and you don't even notice after a while that it's any different from the old. But you'll always uh, have Paris. Um, research shows that people get more enduring satisfaction, enjoyment, enrichment out of experiential purchases than out of material purchases. This has been documented in a variety of different ways. Here is one uh, simple study where you just ask people to think of what's the most significant material purchase you've made in the last five years, or what's the most significant experiential purchase you've made in the last five years, how happy does it make you? So now we've moved several years down the road. 
which is giving them greater satisfaction. They consider their experiences as providing them more happiness today, even though the experience is gone. They consider it uh, money better spent, and so on. Um, you can then ask, well, why is that? Why do we get more enduring satisfaction out of this thing that comes and goes in a flash? There are a variety of different reasons that collude to produce this effect. Uh, one of them is relevant, I think, to our... Uh, why is that there? Um, one of them is relevant, I think, to our discussion today, just stealing another line from... Uh, these are not the right slides. Uh, okay. Ignore that first part, stealing a line from, uh, again, from Casablanca. This could be the beginning of beautiful friendship. Um, our experiences connect us to other people uh, more. That is to say, suppose that um, you bought a new drone, and then I buy a new drone. The fact that we have the same drone, we, we feel closer to each other. But not nearly as much as if you had hiked in New Zealand and I had hiked the same trail. That brings us together uh, more. And so the things you share with people experientially bind you to those people more than the things you share materially. But it goes beyond that. That is to say, our material goods get us focused inward. Uh, it creates a competitive mindset of keeping up with the Joneses is largely keeping up in a material sense. You aren't as envious of other people's experience or it's a different kind of envy, the kind of benign envy where you want to have what they have a lot of the envy you have, uh, people have over material things is a more malignant envy where they want to take down what that person has. And to show that this kind of social connection is really broad, consider the results of another experiment um, that uses a, um, a simple economic game known as the dictator game. Many of you have probably heard of it. Uh, all the subject has to do is figure out how to divide $10. They're given $10 by us, and they can keep however much they want, or give some amount of it to an anonymous stranger who they'll uh, never meet. They do this after having thought about the most significant experiential purchase they've made in the last several years or the most significant material purchase they made. And what you find is getting in touch with these experiences you've had makes you feel more connected to other people. You're more generous in thinking about your experiences than when thinking about uh, your material goods. Uh, so, for our purposes today, uh, the implications, there are a variety of implications of, uh, for this. As uh, our material needs get more easily met, we may define ourselves less in terms of what we have and more in terms of what we do. An unsatisfying era of materialism if we play our cards right, can give way to a more gratifying era of experientialism. Now, it's true that robots and intelligent machines can take away experiential jobs too, but not nearly to the same degree they can take away manufacturing jobs. And it's true that there may not be enough full-time experiential work to go around either, but there may not have to be. That is to say, if we are on the verge of a Keynesian era of leisure, then the bulk of the population, uh, in, uh, in order to uh, supplement the, a basic stipend available to all, or in order to justify a basic stipend available to all, uh, can be engaged part-time in an experiential economy that involves things like secret cinema, immersive theater, vast public art, uh, well-staffed and maintained uh, parks, beaches, trails. Um, and if you don't like any of those things, just think about um, the value to education of this army of part-time experientialists involved in the educational uh, world. Uh, so I think there's a lot to look forward to in this possible future of a more experiential economy, uh, an experiential economy that taps into and nourishes our fundamental uh, social natures. Thank you.